word. We can appropriate your word to our lives and we can walk it out in Jesus' name. Lord, we just thank you now for your, to you be the glory, to you be the honor, and to you be the praise. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. come on, you can do better than that. Everybody said, Amen. Amen and Amen. Well, what an exciting day it is. Uh, what an exciting time to live in. And some of you would say, well, these are some very chaotic times that we're in. And I believe before the end of the message today, you'll see they're also exciting times because for such a time as this, you and I, God chose for us to be born, for us to be here at this particular time because He's got talents and treasures and anointing and calling and giftings in us that He wants to use to flow through us to bring the good of God and the, the healing of God and the mercy of God to the world around us. So we're going to be the light. We're going to be the salt. We're going to be the influence, you and I. And we're going to see today how to go from chaos to order, that God's plan is for us to go from chaos to order. So if there's any chaos in your life, if there's any chaos in our cities, and if there's any chaos in our nation, in this world, God is calling us, the church, to step it up into our place and our position so that God can use us to move it from chaos to order. No matter how young you are, no matter how old you are, God is wanting to use you to bring order to the world we live in. And uh, what we're going to be looking at is we're going to be going back to the Old Testament and we're going to be looking in the book of Judges. And, and let me just give this little teaching real quick before we go there. And that is as we look at the Old Testament uh, teachings of all these Philistines and all of these Moabites and Canaanites and uh, all of those that would come in as the enemy of God's people and they would come in and bring such destruction as we see how they fought them in the natural. All of that is to teach us they represent now how we fight in the spiritual. Because the Bible says that we're fighting not in flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. So we need to understand when we go back to the Old Testament, we read about all of these enemies of God. They had spirits driving them. They had spirits, evil spirits, uh, influencing them. And those same spirits, they don't die, those same spirits are now functioning in and through the situations and circumstances we see around us. And so I want us to learn how to fight by going back to the Old Testament and seeing how they fought in the physical. Let's apply that to the spiritual so that we can do spiritual warfare effectively in Jesus' name. So we are looking at judges today, and here's what, how we let up, lead up to the judges. You remember Moses, how he was uh, the deliverer that God raised to get the Israelites out of slavery, 400 years of bondage in Egypt, and to get them uh, moving through the desert for 40 years as they're moving towards the promised land. Did you remember his successor, Joshua, after Moses dies, Joshua leads the children of Israel, that new generation, across the Jordan River into the promised land, and they go and get established there. And, uh, and then eventually, over the years, Joshua dies, and now that Joshua, that, the leader, is dead, the Bible says this cycle begins to take place with the children of Israel. They would, they would serve God for a season, then they would get lax, they would get lazy, and then they would let the influences of the negative uh, 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 cultures around them come in that were being influenced by these demons and uh, would bring in ungodly practices and ungodly uh, ways. They would start worshiping idols of those foreign gods and so forth, the rejecting God. And when they reject God uh, uh, and, and compromise, they would accept the world's ways. And then it's like they would, they would tear a hole or rip the, the covering of blessing and protection that God had in covenant over them. Their rebellion and their apathy and their willingness to let the influences of the negative uh, world around them come in would just tear a hole into the covering of protection that the covenant gave them. And the enemy would see that tear and they would move in and they would establish themselves uh, strong and they would take the children of Israel into bondage and cause them great, great hardship. And then after 
some years of hardship and for different cycles some would go longer some were more stubborn and then some were would repent immediately but they would eventually get so tired of the chaos and so tired of the pain and so tired of the limitation and the bondage around them they would cry out to God God help us raise up a leader to lead us out of this bondage and they would repent before God and God during the judges would raise up a judge and anoint that judge to be a leader to lead them out of bondage and and that's what the period of the judges is all about now, one thing that was noted in the Judges is Judges 21, 25. You've got this on the screen. In those days, there was no king in Israel. So everybody did what was right in his own eyes. That's how they got in trouble. When there's no king on the throne of your life, you begin to do things that seem to be right in your own eyes. And the enemy fools you. He blinds you. He tricks you. And he leads you in the paths of unrighteousness. And he gets us in trouble. So what we need to see first and foremost is, is Jesus Christ king of kings in our life. Is Jesus the king of kings and the Lord of lords of our life? If Jesus is not the king over our life then you're, you're right in the path of the Israelites when there was no king of Israel, a, a godly king over the children of Israel or the Christians now today, we would say, everyone, you're going to be tempted to do what's right in your own eyes. It, it would, it, so this correlates with doing things that are right in your own eyes with what we would call postmodernism today where no absolutes exist. Does that sound familiar? Everybody has their own truth. Even as absurd, uh, uh, you might say as uh, weird, as odd, as obscure, as, as un unusual, as unheard of. But people, that, that's their truth. And, they, and they wanna, they'll fight for their truth. So in the pe what happens is people individually become their own God and their own king and they do their own thing. And that's a very, very dangerous place to be because it pulls us out from under the covering of the covenant of the blessing and the provision that God has given to us in and through His Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is either Lord of all or He's not Lord at all. He's, he's Lord of lords and King of kings or we, we're on our own. So, there, so what the enemy does when the enemy sees this postmodernism where we do anything that's right in our own eyes, we can call this, this, and that, that, and, you know, I reckon we'll be marrying trees and we'll be, you know, it's all kind of things. Just whatever you want, you do. Uh, there's no superintending, governing, moral guidance to which everyone is subscribed. And the Bible says that the Bible is the plumb line. The Bible is the moral compass. It is our true north. But when you get into postmodernism, you're like going back into the days of judges, and you're like, no, we have no king. We're not answering to any, any moral authority. We're no authority at all. We're going to do what's right in our own eyes, and that's what opens the door for these demon spirits to come in. Uh, because it breaches the veil of protection and the enemy comes marching right in. We see it happening right now in our society. We see it in our own land today. Uh, the Philistines, those same demons that cause those Philistines to march in in the days of the judges is the same spirits that are behind uh, causing uh, authorities to march in and try to establish themselves, uh, uh, ungodly authorities even now, the enemies of God. And the Old Testament enemies represent, I've said it before, i said it again, the evil spirit. So we've got to see that we're not wrestling flesh and blood. Isn't that what Ephesians 6 and 12 says? It says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and, and rulers of darkness of this age and spiritual uh, hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So if you really want to be effective, you've got to go where you can truly make a difference in the war. And the war is in the spirit realm. That's why I've got the puppet guy, the puppet being pulled by the strings there. Really and truly what you see in the natural is being actually uh, impacted or influenced by the strings that are being pulled in the spiritual. 
So these demonic spirits are pulling the strings, the same demonic spirits that pulled the strings in Hitler, those same spirits are still here. They're still here. That, that was in the Philistines is still here. That was in the Moabites is still here. And what we have the authority, because uh, 2 Corinthians 10 and 14 says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not made by the hands of man, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We can go in and cut the strings so that the demonic spirits that are trying to influence and cause all the havoc and chaos in this world can no longer pull the strings. That's where we, the church, have been called to exercise our authority. Because every time the enemy sees that there is chaos in society, they take that as an, uh, uh, an invitation to come in and take advantage of the disintegrating culture. And since no, nobody can get along, when they see chaos, where nobody is getting along, everybody's making their own rules, there's an absence of unity leaving the people vulnerable, uh, the, the Philistine says, okay, this is our opportune time uh, to come in because chaos invites the enemies of God to come in and enslave the people of God. Now, my job is made easy today uh, to make this point real because I don't need to go into a whole lot of effort to try and contextualize the book of Judges for you to imagine what that chaos looks like. All you got to do is watch the news. All you got to do is read a newspaper or look at social media and you see the chaotic situation that is unfolding in our land. So we gotta, we've got to see the importance of what's going on and how we can turn the tide, taking it from chaos to order. You and I, being used of God, can turn the tide. Now, up to this point in Judges 3, we have these judges that Bible talks about, uh, Othanel. Now, Othanel was Caleb's younger brother. Caleb, you know you had a younger brother? You know, he was Caleb's younger brother. And uh, uh, what had happened is uh, Mesopotamia had come in. There was chaos. There was people doing things in their own eyes. They was not uh, honoring God as the ruler of their life. It opened the door. The enemy moves in through Mesopotamia. The king of Cushan uh, Reshethon comes in and, and uh, they uh, uh, take the people of God into bondage. And for eight years they are enslaved for eight years there is misery for eight years their life is horrible and finally they cry out to God God forgive us God we need help God get us out of this terrible chaos that we're in and God raises Caleb's younger brother Othniel up as a judge full of the Spirit of God, powered by God to lead them to victory. They come out of the bondage and they have uh, uh, 40 years of peace. What a blessing. But guess what? The cycle continues. And that next thing you know, after 40 years of peace, they get lazy, they get slack, they get comfortable. They start doing things in their own eyes, which is right. And they, they start, you know, they don't want to answer to God. They don't want to honor God. They don't want to worship God. They don't want to come and celebrate His goodness like we're doing right now. And the next thing you know, the veil of protection is ripped open and uh, the Moabites come in under King Eglon. King Eglon, he's that big fat king the Bible talks about. You remember that uh, Ehud goes in and takes his life with the knife and the fat eats up the knife? Okay, okay, that's just a little side note, but this is, this is that story. And uh, he comes in with the Moabites and they take uh, the Israelites, uh, the people of God, they take them into bondage and uh, 18 years. Now you would think that we wouldn't wait 18 years of misery before we went back to God. I'm saying that to tell us as the church, let us arise in this day and in this hour and not let another day, not let another month, not let another year go by that we're not doing our part, uh, that we're coming to, to God and we're learning to fight the spiritual war that God has called us to do to put an end to the chaos that is growing around us. But 18 years they cry out, God raises up Ehud, as a judge, he goes in and uh, leads them to deliverance and freedom. And then they have 80 years of peace. And you think, man, you think you really are established after 80 years. We, we're going to stay on the path of peace and serving God and honoring God and putting God first. But no, generation rose up. And they're like, you know what? That's good enough for your generation, this God thing, but not for us. 
that serving God and honoring God and put God first for you, that's good for y'all, but not for us. Church, church attendance isn't that important. Worshiping God is not that important. Giving to God is not that important. Serving God is not that important. Using my gifts and talents to honor God is not that important. You know, so that generation comes up and there again rips a hole in the veil of protection that was over them through covenant and the enemy comes in again. This time the Philistines. Same spirits through the Moabites and Mesopotamianites, his same spirit, now through the Philistines, is coming in and causing chaos with the children of God. So much so, the Bible says that they were ruling the main highways, that people could not go out and trade, that people could not go out and, and, and get food, that people could not go out and see family. They were quarantined in their homes, hiding in their homes, afraid to get onto the main roads because the Philistines ruled the roads. They would rob them. They would beat them. They would riot. It was, it was horrible. It was horrific. And, and so the people, if they needed to go somewhere, they would find a backwoods path to try and get from one place to the other, trying to hide from the Philistines. And then the people began to cry out to God, and as God would raise up a judge, we see that just one sentence, one sentence here talks about a judge, but look at this man. After him, or that was Ehud, after Ehud came Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. So he's a judge that God is using to deliver Israel from the chaos that the enemy had brought in through the Philistines. And here, God uses this man. Now, I want to share several principles with you today that if you can grab these principles and you can understand them and implement them, then you too can make a difference in the society that you live in today despite the chaotic things that are happening. We can take these three principles and if we will implement them today, we can bring a turn to the tide of the chaos bringing it back to order as the people of God. We are, you might would say, the judge that God is raising up to fill with His Spirit to do supernaturally through our natural effort the, the, that which is needed to bring the order of God, the favor of God, the blessing of God back to the society that we live in. So please hear me. If we don't make a difference in the world that we live in, it's only going to get worse. If you're waiting for another leader to be elected, if you're waiting for another council to be elected, if you're waiting for another house or senate to be elected in order to bring change, then you're waging war. See, they wage war in the natural. And the Bible says that, that we cannot fight flesh and blood and win. So that's why it's always volleying and always, you know, you gain three steps, but you lose four steps. You gain two steps, but you lose three steps. It's always just fighting in the natural. We, the church, must understand that God's plan was not the Senate. God's plan was not the judicial side. God's plan was not the executive branch. God's plan is for His church. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He did not say a form of government of man will keep the gates of hell from advancing. He said, my church will. So we've got to wake up, we've got to get up, and we've got to be trained and understand and engage in the battle, in the arena where we can make the most impact of taking things from chaos to order being used by God to do this. So here we see in Judges 3 and 31, after him was Shamgar the son of Anath, he killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. The first thing the text shows us is, is, is that before Sam, Shamgar became a judge, it shows us he was a farmer. He was a farmer. He was experienced in using an ox goad. You really can't see it in this picture, but this uh, seven to eight foot pole that a farmer would have that, that it would take, it had a sharp point on the end. It was just a wooden rod with a sharp point on the end. And as, as things evolved, they'd put uh, metal on it. But, but many, years and years back, it would just be a wooden sharp point. And it was used to goad. That's why it's called an ox goad. It would goad or encourage the ox uh, out of their stubbornness to press on 
pulling the plow. Because oxen, they're stronger than men, uh, but they, and, and they're lazy. They got their own mind, they're lazy. And, you know, they, they said, you know, I don't want to pull that plow. I'd rather just stand, uh, sit down here and, and graze and eat. But they were created as a beast of burden to help mankind. So they had to be encouraged, and they were encouraged with an ox goad. Uh, and, and that ox goad was something very important to the farmer. So we see in, you, in understanding that, if we can learn any spiritual lesson from Shamgar, is that number one, he started where he was. He was a farmer. He started where he was, okay? He went from the cornfield to the battlefield. If anything was to change in his future, he had to start right where he was. I am speaking to you today in order for God to bring forth the manifest of heaven on earth in and through his church, we cannot put it off and wait until a later date. We need to start right where we are. We need to say, God, I am here. I am willing to be used by you. I'm not going to make an excuse. I'm not going to delay. I'm not going to wait until I've got this certain degree or I'm not going to wait until I've got this certain position. I'm ready today to be used by you. Shamgar said, here I'm a farmer, but God, if you need a judge to come against the enemy, here am I. I will step into it as a farmer. And, 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 and let me tell you why. You've you got to be careful with the enemy because he's so trick, his trickery is so real, he will come in and start giving you excuses that seem so legitimate. Remember, we're not leaning on the arm of flesh. We're not leaning on the understanding of man, but we're leaning on God. We're trusting God but the enemy will talk you out of saying, well, you're too old. You're too old. You, you, there's no way you can make a difference now. Well, let me tell you, Winston Churchill, when he was 65, became prime minister of England, and he helped lead victory over the Nazi party who was in, influenced and, in, and you might say empowered by demonic spirits to bring the destruction that they brought in this world. It was Ronald Reagan. He was 77 when he stood at that wall of communism in Germany. And he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear this wall down. And he, he began to change, uh, that, that ch change our whole world. I mean, it opened up Romania for my wife to get over here so I could meet her and get married. Hallelujah. Thank you, 77-year-old Mr. Reagan. I appreciate it. Praise God. Michelangelo was 65 when he painted the famous scene, the, the work that he did on the uh, Sistine Chapel ceiling. But did you know he was 88 when he painted the Pauline Chapel? And there, that was considered the most uh, 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 greatest work he ever did at 88 years old. I'm here to tell you, you're not too old. You're not too old. Don't believe the lies of the devil. But you're also not too young. you got to get focused in your youth. My first sermon I preached when I was a teenager was out of Ecclesiastes 12 and 1. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Don't wait say, well, I'm going to live my years and sow my wild oats and then serve God later on. You don't know that you got it later on. And why not go and serve God in your youth? I'm telling you, I speak to the young people. I say, serve God all the days of your life. I remember that first sermon. I told that congregation, I said, I want you to hold me accountable. I'm not, it's because somebody had told me before I preached, they said, well, uh, young, young man, uh, I know you'll probably backslide four or five times, uh, but, but if you get rooted good, you'll, you'll, you know, when you're old, you won't depart from uh, the things of God. And that thing troubled me because they're already superimposing on me an idea that it's okay, seemingly, to backslide and not serve God all the day and, and have all this uh, uh, garbage and all of this uh, load of history that, uh, of years that I, you know, displeased the Lord. I didn't like that. So in that sermon, I told him, I said, I want y'all to hold me accountable. And, and, and probably my Sunday school teacher, Miss Sherry, is watching right now. Uh, and she, I saw she was tuned in earlier. Uh, she probably was in that congregation that Sunday morning. But I said, hold me accountable so that, that I don't ever stray from the Lord. I want to serve the Lord all the days of my life. I don't want to turn my back on Him. And if any of y'all see me turning to the left or the right, come to me. Draw it to my attention because I want my life to honor God. And here I am, 55, and thank God he is still the first premium, number one, uh, uh, numero uno in my life. Hallelujah. Because you have to make up your mind. You have to make up your mind. I'm going to serve the Lord. 
And I'm going to serve him beginning right now. So don't you let youth be an excuse either. Did you know Abraham, uh, 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 Benjamin Franklin, he was 23 years old. He organized and uh, operated a newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette. It was all his. And when he was 25, he founded the first public library. So all the libraries, public libraries around the world, his first one, he started that at 25 years old. At 30 years old in Philadelphia, he founded the first fire station, fire department. So all the fire departments and all that came from this 30-year-old who established that, that, that model. And at 37, he invented the first efficient stove for the home. And if he had invented the AC, I would give him even more high fives because I love the AC. Hallelujah. But he accomplished all these things before he was 40 years old. So no matter how old you are or how young you are, if you want to see things change, start where you are. So too many people say, well, when I get more money or I get more, more education or I get more notoriety or I get a higher position, you know, no, start where you are. Too much of God's kingdom work is not being done on earth because God is waiting for people to start and to start where you are. So if we're going to see the change of God and the power of God and the anointing of God come from heaven through us to this earth, through the church, to to. to push back the forces of hell, then we got to start today. We can't put it off till tomorrow. we got to start today. 2 Timothy 4 and 2 says, Be instant in season and out of season. Instant means prepared, ready, right now. I think at, what, 4 o'clock today, we've got an event uh, down in Norfolk. Come be a part of that. I mean, you can be a positive part of change even today, uh, starting right now, being instant in season and out of season. So I always like to say, get ready, get ready, get ready. I say it to our kids, get ready, get ready, get ready. Not get ready dressed up. I mean, like, let's get ready, get ready, get ready for the move of God. Let's get, get ready, get ready, get ready for the Holy Spirit to say something through us, do something through us. Always being ready in the season, an opportune uh, time. My mom used to say, you got to learn to bloom where you planted. She said, you, you boys were planted here in Earl, South Carolina, on this farmland here, but you got to bloom where you planted. So stop saying, if only I was born at a different time, or if only if I was born at a different place, or only if I wouldn't, you weren't born on the wrong side of the tracks. Let me tell you, God needed you, and he brought you through whatever circumstances you've come through. He can use those circumstances to his advantage. So instead of looking at it and giving the devil all credit, if you had neg negative circumstances that you came through, say, I've come to, to learn. I've been educated, if you can say it that way. I've been educated, okay? I've got experiences and I've got knowledge and I've seen the working of the enemy firsthand. And I'm telling you what, I'm going to help the generation that's coming up not ever have to go through what I went through, never have to see what I did. But I can't do it sitting back. i got to start where I am. And then the second thing about Shamgar is he used what he had. What did he had? He, he had an ox goad. See that stick? He had an ox goad, and that's what he had. And he, but he had 600 Philistines, 600 terrorists, 600 coming against him. But, but, but let me tell you what. He had 600 problems, but he said, I'm going to use what I have. He didn't have an M1 tank. He didn't have a Black Hawk, Hawk helicopter. All he had was an ox goad. And he said, I'll use what I have. And when he decided to use what he had, God anointed it. And it became a supernatural weapon of mass destruction. And that means that's the same thing with you and me. If we will use what we have, if we'll start where we are and use what we have and give it to God, God will take our experiences. He'll take our, 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 our past. He'll take where we're at. He'll take what we know and what we have in our hand, and he can use it to advance his kingdom. He's the one that provides the super on the natural. And he wants us to live a supernatural life. Hallelujah. So I I'm saying that Shamgar's uh, resources were limited, but they weren't limited by God's standard because if you'll take what little talent you have, what little network you have, what little uh, uh, history you have, and you'll give it to God, God can magnify it in supernatural ways. Use what you have. Use what you have. And I speak to all of us. You need to have a dream and a vision you need to be going somewhere. Have a dream, a vision. Don't say, I'm just learning to, to cope with the chaotic mess. 
I, I remember walking into a restaurant one time and I thought maybe the power was out. It was so dim and dark in there and I couldn't see the people. I walked in and, and I'm like, wow. So I was kind of like feeling my way and got to the table and sat down. But after about five minutes, I looked around and I could see everybody's faces clearly. And I thought maybe they turned the lights up. But no, I was getting used to the dark. My eyes were getting used to the dark and, and it lowered my, the level uh, of, of my existence. I, you know, so what I say, rather than us getting used to the dark and putting up with the chaos and saying this is just how it is in 21st century America, I say no. If God has a plan to turn the chaos into order through the church and to push back the gates of hell through the church, then we the church need to be the church and do what the church has been anointed to do so that the devil would be put in the place that he should be put in and we can advance the kingdom of God and roll out the glory of the Lord and the favor of God like it should be. Hallelujah. Praise God. But you've got to have vision and dream. I remember moving here in 1992. I knew no one. And, and uh, I was given this little church that was at the road out here, a little uh, building that was in bad disrepair. And so I'm here to start a church. And I, I, I couldn't do it in a building. It was boggy out there. There was no pavement. It was mud. And I said, you know what? I got to do it in the school. So right down the road at Centerville Elementary, we started in the, in the uh, lunchroom. But when I was in that lunchroom, uh, starting that first service in December of 92... I was seeing this property. And this property I was seeing. I said, God, help me take advantage of the, the, of the acreage that is there. And all this was trees back here and muck and, and swamp. But uh, I, I had a path around it. And I'd walk around it. And I said, God, if this is what you've given me, help me, Lord God, to build a international ministry center. I don't know if it needs to go two, three, four stories. However, I want to maximize the, the footprint of this property, Lord God. Help me. So while we didn't even, we couldn't even use the little building at that time, I was back here with vision and dream. I was dreaming of uh, fulfilling the vision of building a multi uh, uh, cultural, multinational ministry center that would reach around the world taking the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and so much so that in years past, later, I had an architect draw up the pictures of what it would look like one day. They, they are actually mounted on the Welcome Center. Those same pictures used to be in the old chapel because I, I was saying, I've got a vision. This is where we're going. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to house a school from kindergarten to 12th grade, uh, teaching uh, the Word of God. It's going to house a ministry that reaches around the four corners of the earth. Uh, we're going we're gonna to be used of God to bring change and, and godly influence in our community and in our state and in our nation and I said and, and we declared that you guys stood with me we declared that the only reason we're in here today is because when we were little and was told by every bank we went to uh, save the last one uh, that you're you're a joke you're a joke I left one crying because they spoke so harshly against me why did I waste their time trying to bring such a project to them and I walked out in the parking lot I started weeping because I took on shame I took on shame and then I went to start my vehicle and my battery was dead and wouldn't even start and it was about five o'clock and they would be coming out and here I am with the hood up and the battery dead they told me I was broke busted and disgusted and no good and now I have said no so I shut the hood down act like I was on my phone and uh until they all left the parking lot and then you know and and then I like I need help and I'm calling my uh, my mechanic I need they're like well we're closed sorry and I'm like well I need somebody to come and jump me and after everybody left finally I just tried it again and it cranked and I came home and, uh, you know, and I got rid of that vehicle. No. <laughs> but you got to have dream and vision. Because I left there so discouraged and despondent. But I came in the chapel. When you walked in the foyer, if you remember, the picture, one of them was hanging right there. And then you walked around into the behind the back pew over here on the wall. There was another one. And I went and I stood there. And it's not that we worship buildings or anything like that. But this was going to be a sign in the community, a sign in the world, a permanent place. that The ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit was going to be impacting and raising up and equipping and training and sending out and, and encouraging and supporting ministries around the world. We needed that. And, and, and I stood there. And as I looked back at what the vision had been written down, I got my courage back. 
And I said, we're not backing down. We're going forward. We're not going to turn to the left or the right. They were telling me, ah, oh, build something smaller. What's wrong with you? You know, and I said, no, this is the vision. We're going forward. And here we are, what, five years plus now. We've been enjoying this, this beautiful place that God has given us. And God's given us more vision. But you've got to use what you have. And we, we had a little group of people, but we all had a big heart. And we all had faith, right? We all had faith, and we have faith, and God has done great and mighty things. So I want to say to you, no matter how old you are and how young you are, dream big dreams. Dream them and say, God, I want to give you what I have. I, I want to give vision. I want to give vision. And I want to give uh, enthusiasm. Oh, help us, God, to not be these uh, lazy, uh, cool dudes that just lay around and let life pass us by. We need, I mean, it was, I, guarantee, I guess, Shamgar said, you know what? I am sick and tired of these Philistines blocking our roads, these Philistines making us live in fear, these Philistines controlling. I'm sick and tired of it. Enough is enough. And the Spirit of God came on him and that enthusiasm, and he takes an ox goad, and he gets them victory in that day. I say, I pray this sermon would get somebody stirred up today, and that you would... I want to be like uh, Eugene Ormandy. Okay, anybody ever heard of Eugene Ormandy? He's a Hungarian-American uh, conductor, and he was taking one of... Uh, uh, Brahms famous uh, 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 musical pieces and he was taking the symphony and he was leading them and in one particular place Brahms had a handwritten instruction uh, play as loud as you can so here's Ormandy he's uh, waving his arms and his gesticulation with such power trying to get the orchestra to play louder and louder and, and then following that section there was another handwritten note by Brahms on the music saying even louder even louder still so Armandy he's like man he's throwing his arms and he's trying to get him to play even louder and even louder so passionate he throws his shoulder out of joint huh. so after the program the press are laughing at him and they tell they're teasing him by saying you know how does it feel to throw your shoulder out of joint over a piece of music and I love his reply he said, I know some people who have reached middle age and never had enough enthusiasm to dislodge a necktie, not to mention throw their shoulder out for anything. I want to throw my shoulder out of joint if I have to with enthusiasm of doing God's work, okay? Kind of like the Pittsburgh Steelers. Uh, I'm a Dallas fan, so I'm only using this because it fits, okay? But they, they, back in the day, they had what was called the Steel Curtain, their defensive team, the Steel Curtain. And there was one gentleman, Ernie Stotner. He was the smaller one, but there was enthusiasm in him, and he would play harder, and he uh, made himself to be one of the top leading defensive uh, linemen there. And, and one time it is said that uh, he came back to the huddle uh, right after he broke his thumb in the play and his thumb was broken and laying all the way back on his hand and the bone was exposed and they say that he took his thumb and he flipped it back and he wrenched it down into a fist and he says what's the next play what's the next play at halftime he goes to the doctor there uh, and they wrap it up they wrap it up they wrap the thumb to the fingers and wrap this big ball around his hand and they said the second half he was seen beating people uh, beating them with that hand and then at the end of the game when it was all over and they won he said I think I need a doctor <laughs> man I want to play like that I want to live life like that I wish I could get some Christians that passionate, enthousi enthusiastic about doing God's work and serving God. Think about it. He played hurt. How many Christians do you know will play hurt? Well, I got my feelings hurt. Don't think I'm going to go back there. Got my feelings hurt. Come on now. We're in a day and an age where if you're going to be a kingdom advancer, you've got to learn to play hurt. If you're going to be a giant killing, devil destroying soldier of God, you've got to learn to play her. If you're going to be part of the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ that keeps the pressure on the gates of hell and keeps pushing them back, you've got to learn to play her. Hallelujah. You need some enthusiasm to move forward. Hallelujah. And you also, with that enthusiasm, you definitely need to say, God, whatever I have, whatever I have, I'm going to use it for your glory. Whatever talent I have, whatever gifts I have, whatever experience, I'm going to use it for your glory. And then finally, we see with Shamgar, he did what he could do. He did what he could do, 
And then he relied on God to do only what God will do. This reminds me of this powerful story. And I'm giving you kind of the timeline here. Starts back on April 20th, 1855. Here, a preacher is preaching one Sunday morning, and one of the Sunday school teachers, his name is Edward Kimball, is in the service. And uh, he, he had Sunday school. He had about 10 teenage boys in his Sunday school class before uh, the main service, and then they come in, and the preacher is preaching on the importance of evangelism and saying, if you can just reach one person with the love of God, if you can just reach one person with the salvation message of Jesus Christ, you never know what God will do through that person. So don't wait to reach the crowds. Reach the one person. And here, the Sunday school teacher is so moved by the sermon, uh, the next day he goes and he needs some shoes. You know, he looked at his shoes that Sunday. He said, you know what, i got to get some new shoes. These things are wore out. So he goes into a shoe store, and here a 15-year-old sales clerk named Dwight L. Moody comes up to serve him. Sir, not what shoes are you looking for? What size are you looking for? And he's getting those shoes and helping him. So while he's assisting him, he's looking at this 15-year-old teenager who's selling him a pair of shoes, and he's hearing the pastor's sermon. If you can just reach one, if you can just reach one, start where you're at. Do what you can. Do what you can. He, so he started sharing the love of Jesus with this 15-year-old boy. And this 15-year-old boy, the Spirit of God began to convict his heart. And the next thing you know, Dwight L. Moody gets born again, and then he gets called to preach. He gets called to preach. You ever heard of Dwight L. Moody? Well, he's later, he's preaching there in Europe and, and, and he's helping shape the world by the preaching of the gospel. And uh, his meetings are drawing hundreds and then they get bigger and they start drawing thousands. And one of the services he's preaching in, a young American is visiting Europe and he goes into the service. His name is Frederick Meyer and he hears P Moody preach. And let me tell you why, he gets saved. He's like, man, I want to serve the God that Dwight L. Moody's serving. So he gets saved and he comes back to America and then he gets called to preach and he starts preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and auditoriums start filling up and, and one of the services he's preaching in a man by the name of Wilbur Chapman gets born again and he has a dream to reach professional athletes with the gospel message of Jesus Christ and he starts the YMCA come on now so now, one day, a man named Billy Sunday hears Chapman's messages, and he gets saved. So Billy Sunday is playing professional baseball with Chicago, and he leaves the fame, and he leaves the fortune, and he begins to preach. And he's invited down to Charlotte, North Carolina, to preach there at, some, at a meeting that was sponsored by these local Christian businessmen. And at that meeting, they were so successful, it was time for Billy Sunday, he had a, a schedule, an appointment to go somewhere else, but they said, no, these meetings can't stop. Do you have anybody you can leave here to keep preaching these meetings? He said, I do. His name is Mordecai Ham. So then Mordecai Ham comes in and continues preaching the meetings in Charlotte, North Carolina. And one day a 17-year-old tall, lanky teenager comes in and he walks down the aisle after the sermon and he gives his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And his name is Billy Graham. And then Billy Graham has been used by God to win more people to Jesus than anybody else in our lifetime. Uh, and his success goes all the way back to a pastor who preached, had some enthusiasm to reach out and tell somebody about Jesus. And Edward Kimball was willing to tell a salesboy that was helping him with a pair of shoes about the love of God. Hallelujah. You may say, Pastor, I can't preach like that and, and I can't hold crusades to reach millions. And that may be true, but can you reach the person that is selling you a pair of shoes? Do what you can. If you will do what you can, God will do what you can't. Do what you can. You can pray. I'm telling you, there's power in prayer. You can pray. That's one thing you need to do. You can persevere. You can press through the, the hard times. Press through the challenges. Don't ever give up. Don't ever quit serving God. A common answer that comes from the most successful people in the world when they're asked, how do you succeed? They say it's simple. It's very simple. When you start something, finish it. See it through to the end. If you start serving the Lord, finish it. See it to the end. Serve God all the days of your life. Serve God all, every day, not just on Sunday and just on Wednesday, but every day. Pray, persevere, press on. I'm telling you, if you'll do that, it, it, you'll see great and mighty things. So many people stop short of the miracle manifest of what God wants to do in your life. 
There was a man, Tom Monahan. Anybody ever heard of him? 1960, he bought a hole in the wall pizza shop. And for eight years, he did nothing but struggle. He was trying his best to sell pizza to pay the lease. And he, he just, he, it was just barely, barely making it. Then a fire broke out in the kitchen. That little hole in the wall burnt. And the insurance company came in and gave him one cent, one penny on the dollar of what he lost. Man, he tried to rebuild. He tried to get going. And, and after two years, the, the bank had to come in and repossess everything. He said, I got to keep going. So in 1971, he kept going, he kept going, he kept going. Uh, he started another place and got it to one and a half million dollars in debt. He said, how can I turn this thing around? He, he said he reached out, God, how can I turn this thing around? And he said, God gave him a brilliant idea. He said, this is what you do. Instead of having people come and eat your pizza, how about you deliver pizza to them? Can you imagine that that used to didn't exist? Did you, that, that's amazing. So he got this idea, I'll deliver pizza, and it worked. Today, Domino's Pizza is the largest pizza chain in the world. Domino's has nearly 17,000 stores in 90 countries. They deliver over 3 million pizzas a day. They employ over 350,000 people, and they took in over $14 billion last year. All from a man who could have given up when his circumstances got down. I'm telling you, don't let your circumstances dictate your future. Mother Teresa was often asked to speak about how she could help, how she helped feed the children of Calcutta. And, and, and uh, people would come to her and they would say, can, can I give up everything and go back with you to Calcutta? And she always replied with these four-worded answers. She'd say, find your own Calcutta. Find your own Calcutta. Come on now. We've got to learn to persevere. We've got to learn to start where we're at Use what we have and do what you can. And if you're willing to do that, God will come in on what seemingly is so puny. He'll come in and he'll supercharge it with his anointing and his power and bring forth glory that only he deserves. Amen. Through your life, God wants to use you to do great and mighty things. I'm here to tell you, I'm on, I'm on assignment from God. And I'm speaking his heart to you. He put you here to do great and mighty, miraculous, supernatural, cultural changing things. But you got to start where you're at. You got to use what you have. And you got to do what you can do. And say, Lord, I do it for your glory. And let God do the rest. Let God do the rest. In the days of the judges, the people had no king. They honored no king, no authority. And they would do things that seemed right in their own eyes, which broke the covenant of God wide open. And the enemy took advantage and came in and brought chaos and bondage and destruction and sickness and sorrow and death. But when they would learn their lesson and say, God, we want to put you on the throne. God, this is a theocracy. We're serving you. You're, we're seeking first your kingdom and your righteousness. I give my life to you. God would raise up a farmer. He would raise up someone like Ehud. He would raise up Othniel. He would raise up Shamgar. A man so simple that he just knew how to farm and use an ox goad. But God would come on it. And supernaturally deliver his people. If you will make Jesus Christ king of kings and lord of lords of your life. I'm here to tell you you're beginning first step to turn the chaos into order. The first step of turning this thing around is making Jesus Christ the king. Because where there's no king, the enemy is going to take advantage of you. Is Jesus Christ the Lord of your life? Is Jesus Christ first in your life? If not, salvation, deliverance, the covenant blessings, the covenant prov the provisions, you've, dis you've just said, I don't want any of that because I reject Jesus. Don't reject Jesus. He loved you so much that he came and gave his life and hung on a cross and shed his blood 
to get the curse off of you so he could get the blessing on you and get your sins washed white as snow as though you'd never sinned, justified by him. He's a good, good God. Is he your God? Would you stand with me, please? Father, we stand in your presence now. Holy Spirit, we ask that you speak, move. Ever so gentle to our, in and through our hearts, Lord God, to bring us to a place of conviction or recognition or reaffirmation. To where we would say here this morning, Jesus, Jesus, I make you the King of kings and the Lord of lords of my life. Jesus, I enthrone you in my heart that I will live for you all the days of my life. Would you make that commitment to him right now, calling upon Jesus, the Son of the living God, to be your Lord and your Savior? The Bible says anyone who calls on the name of Jesus shall be saved. Jesus, Jesus, Son of God, I enthrone you. Tell him, I enthrone you as King of kings and Lord of lords of my heart. For me to live is Christ. And that's what the Apostle Paul said. For me now to live is Christ. For me to go into this rest of this Sunday and this Monday, Tuesday, and the rest of this week, I'm going to live as a child of God. I'm going to live as a Christian. I'm going to live for Christ. For me to live is Christ. Thus, for me to die is gain, because eternity is mine with him. Call upon the name of Jesus, 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 Jesus. Be my Lord, be my Savior, this day and forever.